Welcome to the Scottish Watches podcast. It has been another crazy week. The $100 million question being asked of Only Watch where did the money go? Swatch Mania has returned and it has actually helped Blompong with their sales and it's Baltic here in Scotland. We've got some new releases from them, plus some show reports from Pietro over in Ireland. And speaking of further afield, Dave, you're not in the usual back cave. Where are you? I'm at my parole hearing. I'm hoping to get released if uh, this goes well. But other than that, I've been a very good boy. I'm currently in neutral country that being Switzerland. So let's get into things. There's been many reports in the media over the last few days, Watch Pro's done it, uh, Watches by SGX have commented on it about Only Watch and we've had Luke from Only Watch on the show maybe two years ago. He's a friend of Max from MBNF, Barbara Plumble knows him, we met him at Dubai Watch Week but there are lots of questions being asked. There's some allegations kind of being made Nothing is concrete. There's been nothing, you know, it's not like Periscope when he took Omega to task along with various other people in the past. This is all very early stages. But going by the reporting from other places, what is the story as it's developing just now? But what is the story? I guess there are some questions being asked as maybe more where I would put it as opposed to allegations. But certainly there are a few people asking, I think, to be honest, fair questions about transparency, accounts and record keeping of the charity and associated entities, that being the companies or group companies that receive the funding from this charity auction. And a few people have kind of said, okay, so you guys raise a lot of money and we're talking 25, 30 million per auction at the moment. So, you know, over the last few years, we're talking hundreds of millions of of euros or Swiss francs or whatever currency you want to choose in. And they're basically saying, we'd like some better visibility about where this is going because there doesn't seem to be too much in the public domain. There was a little bit of silence initially. Then there's been some information given out and that maybe for some of these people opened up a few more questions the people asking the questions are being very specific about say, we're not throwing accusations out there. What we're doing is we're asking questions that a large charitable organisation, if it's being transparent, should be able to answer easily and quickly. And we're a little bit perplexed by the lack of answers. As always in these things, there's a few folk in social media jumping on, shouting fraud and con men and all these things, which is harsh at this point in time. Who knows how this will pan out, but... I think it's only good that anything like this does have a degree of transparency because whilst, you know, myself, you, Ricky, and probably the vast majority of people listening to this aren't maybe in the position to be bidding on some of these pieces because they go for such huge amounts of money, you want to be pretty damn sure your money is going to good cause and that the majority of it's not being used for other purposes. I'm not saying it is. It very much might be that everything does go to charity. The problem is nobody can actually check that out for themselves. So that's kind of the way I see it. Take a back seat just now, watch what's going on, try not to draw conclusions until we've got more definitive information. That's kind of my take as well. I've seen Periscope popping up and asking questions and it is the asking questions stage like you say. The word allegation has been used by some people but until we get more information, who knows? And fingers crossed everything works out but that's what we hope the bottom line will be charities are a very strange thing across the world they are the thing that are most scrutinized because you're playing with people's trust hopes and dreams the dreams that cures can be found the dreams that people that are in need can get aid and help so we really do hope things work out for the best here there are lots of comments on the Only Watch page from people getting their oar in and saying their little piece. That is social media. That is the nature of the beast. We've seen it many times before. So there are a couple of Instagram pages to keep an eye on that. Santa Laura. Details will be in the show notes and the description of the video and also Periscope. So as more information comes out, literally a couple of days ago, there was a PDF Only Watch uploaded to their website with details of currently what's happening. They've employed KPMG as auditors, but that then cause more questions to be asked about what's been happening over the past X amount of years. So keep an eye on it and we'll see how things go. And the risk checks are what follow. And I'm going to go first because Dave likes to come second. And I am wearing a watch that's been sent across from Elshan at the Zelos Watch Company. 
and it's the latest iteration of his swordfish family, and this one is impressive, let me tell you all about it. So Zealas are no stranger to the show, thanks to Jody at Just One More Watch, more chat about him and his new release later on and how that's going. This one here is, as I mentioned from the swordfish family, it's 40mm stainless steel, and the party piece little trick that this one has is it has a meteorite dial, something that's usually reserved for far more expensive watches from big companies. For instance, if you were to get a meteorite dial on a, a Rolex Daytona or something of that ilk, you'd be paying many thousands more for it. When it comes to Zelos, the big trick is the price. This one here, I believe, is 499 US dollars. The amount of loom on this watch is absolutely incredible. It doesn't say in the spec, but I believe it's a sandwich dial because the amount of loom in it is just, it's mind boggling. It looks like a nuclear furnace glowing away all night on the nightstand. And when you actually factor in the amount you get with the watch, it has got a fantastic bracelet, fantastic extension on the clasp itself. If I take it off the wrist, rotate it round, have a look in the back, you can actually see you have got a hell of a lot of extension and it's not a cheap and shitty one like you may have seen on other inexpensive watches. The only slight niggle is that you will get stung if you're in the UK with customs fees, but that equates to around about 70 bucks. Well worth it for a watch like this. On the case back, it's not clear, you've got the swordfish, you have got easily removable quick release bracelet options, you can drop a strap there, leather, rubber, your complete choice. And I think I will actually include a loom shot in the show notes because this thing is absolutely stunning. Loads of choices of colours available on the website. For once, they've not all sold out. That's the usual problem with Zelos. As soon as they're announced, you go to the website and everything is unavailable. Thankfully, this time, you can grab your hands on this. So check the show notes, check the YouTube video. Obviously, you will see lots of cool video clip pictures and all the rest. This is a firm favourite. They can do no wrong in my eyes for the money that they charge. Quibbles would be colour match date disc, which you're not going to get on a meteorite dial. And perhaps the bracelet is ever so slightly jingly. But again, at that price point, solid end links, quick release, that diver's clasp with the extension built in, you cannot complain whatsoever. And they've actually changed up. So if you bought one of these watches in the past, you may have been accustomed to receiving it in some funky packaging. Well, they've changed it up again. First it was a watch roll, then it came in a rather funky aluminium metal box. This time around, you get a travel case where you can actually hold three different watches inside, but it still comes with the best warranty card on the planet which is made from, I don't even know what you would say here, it's some kind of perforated, laser engraved copper effect. That is the best warranty card on the planet. So Dave, you've seen it on the pictures, you've seen it on the video, what's your thoughts on this one? I think it's a great looking watch to be honest with you. Size wise, pretty much on the nose, 40mm, pretty short on the lug as well, but 46mm I think, 12-ish mil thick, nothing oversized about it i think it's very wearable even on a kind of slightly smaller wrist i think this would look amazing on like a kind of gray tropic rubber strap personally bracelet looks great i just think it's you know it's quite a chunky bracelet and i don't mean that in a bad way but it is a pretty chunky affair this on a really nice gray rubber strap with that green meteorite dial would look so good in my opinion um you know for that money you really genuinely can't knock it. So there we go, that is my wrist check done. Brand new watch from Zelos. Grab it while you can. It will not stay on their website for long. Time to switch over and ask Dave what he has got adorning his wrist today. Well, on the basis that I'm in Switzerland at Arash, it would be pretty tricky if I wasn't wearing an Arash, to be honest. And, you know, I think it's fair to say I'm wearing my next little sample, which I haven't actually worn for long, and that is the Super Seed Date in Blue, and uh, it's got an orange second hand, so of course it's got a bit of orange in it. This is the Blue Sunburst Down on here, with the loom that's white during the day, but glows in a very similar bluey green colour to the watch you are showing there. This kind of bright pop of orange in the second hand looks great against it. Same case as you will be familiar with from the Super Seed GMT, albeit this is just date function. And you've got, there we go, let's see if I can catch the light. And there we go, we have the K2 micro rotor movement on there. This one with a gold rotor rather than the platinum, which is still an option. So you can still get the sticker on the case back there. Now this one, you know, 
has kept one of the features, which is the jumping hour hand. So if you want to adjust the hour quickly and the time, you can jump set the hour hand on there as well, which is a neat wee function that's been carried over from the GMT. So that is what I am wearing as it comes back into focus. Okay, question time on that one. How thin is that? Because I've never really asked that question before. And when you're holding up to the camera, that is incredibly thin. There are two answers to that question. So effectively, it depends exactly how you configure it. So I'll maybe take it off and show you again. So yes, it is at its thinnest designation, 9.98. And that's including the crystal. Now, we have an option on the case back crystal that is either a flat version, which will give you an overall dimension of 9.98 or well, there's a very fractionally domed crystal for the case back as well which pushes it up to i believe 10.28 so fractionally over 10 mil personally i like it on the slightly domed crystal because instead of having a flat piece of glass against your wrist which when it's warm might stick to the wrist the little doming allows less of a contact point on your wrist so it's maybe not quite as sticky against the wrist so it really depends frankly you know, fractions of a millimetre make very little difference to me. If you want to be, you know, the kid to the playground that can say, my watch is under 10 millimetres thick, then the flat case back is the one for you. So hope that answers the question. It certainly does. And we should probably get on to some new releases. Now, we had the opportunity to catch up with the guys from Baltic Watches at the Global Red Bar. Now, they've got a new release out that we got to have a sneak peek of everybody can now see it everybody can now hear about it so let's talk about that one and you can give us the run through so this is a new family from baltic called hermetique and the first watch or the first set of four watches that fall into this hermetique range is the tourer i think this is a interesting watch from them obviously when they first kind of came to market you had their micro rotor movement you've obviously always had amazingly strong value for money out of their watches very much like Zelos super spec packed for the money that you're paying for it but this is taken somewhere in between maybe a field watch and a kind of more vintage dress watch is where I say it's not quite fully field watch but it's not too dressy either four colorways you've got a green and it's a proper green it's not like a really dark bottle green it's definitively green you've got a blue again very much a kind of mid fractionally toward a darker blue you've then got this vintage burnt tobacco-y brown color and then more unusually you've got a color that you would more expect to see on a leather strap which is quite a tan color but it's quite you know, sandy tan but it's really nice not too yellowy not too mustardy i think the that tan color for me of all of them i should have been drawn to the green because i do like a green dial and it's a, it is a nice green the blue is a little bit safe. The tobacco -y one, lovely, but probably been done before. That tan dial is really, really quite nice. A few options there as well. You can have a kind of tropic style urethane strap, which personally I think works the best. There's a bead to rice bracelet and a flat leg bracelet option in there as well. 550 euros on the rubber, 620, 650 euros on the bracelets, depending on which one you choose. It's a pretty solid bang for buck, this one as well. Miyota movement in there, nothing super fancy, nothing to maybe write home about, but it'll do the job. It'll be reliable and it allows you to have a really cool looking watch for 500 bucks, which I think very few folk could argue with. Baltic is a brand that has just continued to grow. It started out perhaps like your Montas and your Nodis. It was an inexpensive micro brand which did good things but over the years more and more people have got involved in it they have appeared in more and more places they even were on the top billing on Hodinkee's website today the guys when they came to Scotland they couldn't have been nicer we heard people chatting behind the scenes saying this brand was good that brand was good but the guys at Baltic were so open and honest and they were chatting about you know the history of where they've come from their plans for the future and they always appear at the enthusiast events. It's not the big highfalutin shows. They turn up to like wind up watch fair and various things like that. So it's great to see new releases from them and them hitting the headlines because they totally deserve it. The only other bits we missed, I guess, were reasonably pertinent. 37 mil case, which is absolutely going to make a lot of people happy. Just over 10 mil thick. 
They have got this weird thing though where they give you a thickness excluding the domed sapphire top and bottom, but really that's a bit mute because they are definitely part of the thickness of the watch. So just over 10 mil. You know what that's like, Dave? That's like those Americans. That's like those Americans when they talk about cars and they do, is it the one foot delete on the not to 60 time to make things look absolutely incredible and the rest of the world are like, yeah, we'll give you the proper times. Basically, yes. But you know, as I say, to be honest, nothing to be ashamed at. Just over, you know, ten mil on a watch. It, you know, even at, I mean, even at bigger money, much bigger money, a ten mil watch is a pretty impressive bit of engineering. To be honest, now, Dave, where should we take things? Fifty fathoms. Want to go that deep? Yeah. So it turns out that Swatchamania does run wild across the world more than once. It obviously happened last year and helped Omega with their Moonwatch and various other models, pre-owned and new in boutiques. And it kind of has had the same effect this time around with Blanc Blanc. So what's the story? It appears to be having some effect in that the pre-owned values of Blanc Blanc's 50 Fathoms seem to have crept up the way. And again, it's also fair to say that the general pre-owned market at the moment is tending down, not up. So it's bucking that trend. So some early kind of indications might seem to show that this Swatch Mania effect where they've released, you know, their, their second collaboration with a sister brand within the Swatch Group seems to be having a positive impact on the big brother brand in this case, that being Blanc Pump. So yeah, I think it's pretty cool. I am not the biggest fan of the 50 Fathoms. You am not 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 You am not Hmm, okay. I don't know, who cares? I am not, I am am not, I am not the biggest fan of 50 Fathoms. A couple of the Limited editions, I think I've mentioned before, the smaller ones have a bit of appeal. I'm kind of where Ricky's at with Gerard Perigo price-wise with the 50 Fathoms. I think there's much better watches to be had for a much more attractive price point. And Omega Seamaster, to be to me, blows the 50 Fathoms out of the water technically and certainly from a price point perspective, decimates it, you know. But we have a question for both of us from a listener. If you're interested in getting in touch with us, you want uh, your comments, your questions, your feedback read out in the show, drop us an email, never DM us. That email address is info at scottishwatches.co.uk. So Dave, do you want to take it away and tell us what Ryan is asking? Hi, Ricky and Dave. Long time listener since the first double digit episodes. I've been watching Kyman Wong on YouTube since the digital review days. He has an awesome watch collection. I think you would make a great guest to talk about all things watches and photography. Keep up the great work and natural, unforced banter. Kind regards, Ryan Spaulding. So, thank you for that, Ryan. Maybe we should investigate. What do you think? I have already investigated and I love a bit of double digits. So I got in touch with Mr. Wong through his YouTube channel. I have not received a reply yet, but if people are listening to this and they follow him, which I actually do because his camera and lens reviews are brilliant. He did one recently on the new Nikon. Everybody seems to be releasing cameras that look vintage and Nikon did this with the ZF I think it's called which is the full frame version of their smaller camera and <laughs> he was saying how he was allowed to record certain things but they confiscated his phone so he couldn't get anything out into the public ahead of the embargo. Very funny guy, great channel, lots of great content there and yes he'd be a fantastic guest so if you follow him maybe leave a comment to say hey check your email the guys at Scottish Watches want a word. But we should probably move on and talk about things that we do have a little bit of control about just now and that is some new releases. But before that, can you tell us why it is that you are in this crazy looking location here? What is the story? I'm here because this week we actually put to market the Tourbillon 2. And that's something that myself and obviously you, Ricky, over at the trip in Spain we had a few weeks ago where the press were introduced to this. We released it to the masses and I even have a couple of samples here, um, which we can, I guess, show the camera. Here we have the Tourbillon 2 with the Grand Fou enamel dial. And this is in the light Rosa 3N yellow gold case. You can see here it is very similar case-wise to the Tourbillon 1, with one major difference, that being that it's 1.8 millimetres thinner. Why is it thinner, you may ask, when it has the same movement? That is because any of you who listen to the podcast or have listened to any of the previous Arash episodes will know that the Tourbillon movement back in the day was being worked on with a third party. 
They then decided to take their toys and go home and left us to our own devices, which was both worrying at the time, but has led to the tree bearing fruit with our own in-house tool beyond movement. But the original case was engineered to fit that movement, which was originally planned to be thicker than we managed to eventually come up with. So for this new iteration of the case, same diameter, 39mm in the case, 41mm of the bezel, which is a slight overhang, but the movement is thinner than was originally going to be, therefore we've managed to bring the case down, which brings it down to pretty much 10mm on the nose rather than 118 so many people are going to be happy about that. Check the show notes out because the blue dial is a femto laser engraved pattern on it, which is taken inspiration from papyrus papers from an 8th century Irish manuscript. That sounds very convoluted and a bit highfalutin, but maybe check the show notes out. You can see a picture of the papyrus paper and the kind of texture that you get through it with these kind of wavy lines. We've managed to recreate that with a femto laser, which is no mean feat on the basis that some of those lines are so tightly packed together, but still have a really clean definition. Then with this blue treatment, over and above this laser engraving to get this really nice deep blue texture. But because of all of those engraving marks, it really plays with the light. Stainless steel case available, white gold case available, and yellow gold case available. All of them, same dimensions, and you can choose between the blue dial or the white gourmet food dial. You can mix it and match it any way you want. So really, that is pretty much everything you probably would want to know about it. I want to first of all say that this is the reason we didn't chat about these releases on the last show. I knew we were going to have to go in depth because you work for Arage, we've had them on the show a number of times. There is no crossover, as in they are our paymasters, we have to say nice things about them. Historically, I have not done that. But it was a year ago. We actually went across to Beale. We were invited across before you joined the company because that was only started this year and we were sworn to secrecy because this was Turbion 2, the project, and we got to go behind the scenes at the actual place where they make the dials. And this was a story we kind of talked about but we didn't go too deep in because we didn't want to let the cat out of the bag what was coming this year. But this shows the intricacies and the in-depth workmanship that goes into creating just a dial. Not even a new watch, a new movement, a new case, a dial. And that was a year in the making. And again, like last year, we said the amount of duds that came out when they were making these dials was incredible. We were stood next to, I wouldn't even call it a bucket, I would call it a vat, a vat of broken enamel dials. You know how small an enamel dial is? Tiny, thin, intricate, small thing like that. This was packed. There must have been hundreds of thousands of them in there that were all buggered. So yeah, it has been a long story, a long stage process to get to where we are today. But been across in Spain with you and the guys, Florian, watching all that information as I spoke about a couple of weeks ago there, I am keen to get Florian and Andy back on the show within the next month or two because that information is what our audience would love. They want the technical spec. They don't really care too much when you've got a CEO that's a little bit of a pompous up on stage telling you this, telling you that. Andy tells it like it is. He doesn't hide anything. He tells you where the stuff's made. He gives you the address of the factory that they work with. That is the level of transparency that perhaps only what should be looking at. I think that's very fair. You know, um, yes, I have a degree of bias. I work with the guys. But when we were over there, I absolutely wasn't working with them. And we were very lucky to be invited into, you know, what is regarded as one of the kind of premier manufacturers of Grand Fou Enamel Dials in Switzerland. We've said who it is. It's Don Skadar. These guys are... The best at what they do, certainly in Switzerland, they make dials for a vast plethora of premium brands that you would expect. Not fair for me to name those brands because they're not my brands to name. But I think Ricky will agree with me. We saw most of the brands that make you kind of nod your head and go, yeah, they're pretty good when we were seeing around there. If any of you are interested in the kind of process of how these guys do enamel dials, uh, there's a, a link in the show notes. There's a little video that we made. In fact, Ricky helped to do some of the video work for that. And, you know, have a look at it. And it explains basically how enamel dials are made. It happens to be our dial. But the same process could go for a multitude of different enamel dials from brands out there as well. And it wasn't just Turbion 2. That was one of the feats of engineering that were showcased when we went across. There was another watch, and that one actually gained more attention because it seems to be just made of diamond. So have you got some information on this one we can talk about? I do. Unfortunately, I was hoping to have it right here, but there is only one. 
there is one in existence and it's currently residing with Sur, who is uh, discussing with a potential client this watch. This is a project that Sue very much took as something as a passion project for her. And do you want to tell us who that is for people that don't know? Yeah, Sue is ultimately, I guess, the big boss. Many of you will have seen Andy on here or seen Andy on YouTube or on the podcast or heard his voice or even seen him at events. But Sue, who is Andy's wife, she's the brains behind the operation that is Arash. Years and years, in fact, decades worth of knowledge and understanding of the watch industry predominantly back in the day from the OEM days supplying bracelets cases clasps all sorts of components to the greater Swiss watch industry someone who's originally from Taiwan lived in Germany when she was getting her kind of education and then moved to Switzerland she is a genuine font of knowledge when it comes to watches and how it basically all works so this diamond watch the Yi spelt Y-I which is since Newcastle, but it's definitely ye. That is a passion project where she wanted to investigate sustainability of lab-grown diamonds compared to, say, you know, natural mined diamonds using kind of materials, whether it's our K1 movement, and looking at ways that you can play it ultra-luxury while still having a kind of nod and an understanding of the impact that these things have, and also, frankly, to make something really pretty. Is it my thing? No. Is it shiny? Yes. I think it's interesting, Ricky, you were there at the event when it was launched. And, you know, I, I guess a future guest we're going to have is Scarlett Baker, who is a, a, a woman watch journalist operating out of the UK. She was rather taken by it when she put it on. I think everybody was, including the gentleman in the room. And this is not a watch for me at all. But I did get some sneaky pictures of it and sent them to Simona and she is very black or white when it comes to liking things or hating things and you can never tell i mean some of the watches she loves i look at and i'm like yeah okay cool this one she adored she thought this was fantastic and it was the story that caught me the look of the watch on paper for me no don't care it's a diamond watch but even the dial the way it was made the way the colors it's like a spectrum effect, the way that the light comes back at you. And that's due to a very particular process. But even the the cut of the diamonds, and we should talk here about how the diamonds were actually created. This is before the likes of Breitling got in in the game and talked about lab-grown diamonds and, you know, the background and the history of yanking stuff out of the ground by young children. The guys at Raj have been working on this for years and years and years. So it was a great story as much as the watch is an absolute feat when it comes to diamonds, the amount of carrots are involved, the invisible setting of it, the dial arrangement, the movement that's in the back. It was the way it all came together that caught me. Absolutely. So to maybe to address a few of those points quickly. Yep. Uh, the case is made up of over 100 baguette cut diamonds. Total weight is in and around 17.5 carats. Very high colour, clarity and grade of diamonds are used here. Yes, they're lab grown, but it's using, you know, a very interesting technique. Too much to go into here, but we'll put plenty of links to kind of some videos and some, you know, YouTube videos and such like that you can watch if you want to see a bit more about that. The dial, huge amount of time and effort taken to kind of come up with the colour striations. Again, huge amount of detail there. Check out the show notes for all that information. But... We've been working on a project, that being a documentary in an about half an hour long documentary, professionally done by somebody who has also won an Oscar, we will reveal his name in due course, who really helped us to put together a, a documentary about the beginnings, the middle and where we are today with Araj as a brand and more about the people than about the products. So whether it's Sue or Andy or Florian or Landon or people along the way in the business who have helped to shape us to what we are as a brand today. So I think it's quite an interesting thing. It's warts and all. We talk about the good and the bad. So yeah, I think that's going to be something super exciting. I'll agree. I got to see it. And again, it was a select few people at this event that did see it and they weren't allowed to record anything. They haven't had any clips of it. And it reminded me a little bit of a David and Goliath story because Araj Andy, Sue, they have been in the industry, but they ain't Rolex. 
the Ain't Swatch Group, the Arn LVMH or Richemont, they are a very small fish in a very large pond, but they have been making a very loud noise to the point where they have caught the ire of a lot of people in the industry and a lot of targets have been on their back for a number of years, especially when it comes to silicon technology. But they have, we said it in the show before, they have run ahead. They didn't wait for patents to expire before they started investigating and doing their research. They were already two miles down the road ahead, all these guys, and they're winning. So yeah, this is a fantastic documentary. Can't wait for it to come out. Don't know how it's going to be released. Don't know if we're going to have a meetup to watch it. There's lots of talking behind the scenes about how that's going to be facilitated. But if you get the opportunity in the future, or you're watching or listening to this months or years down the road, because our content constantly gets listened to and watched by people three years, four years down the road. Yeah, go and have a look for this. It'll be well worth it. And check the show notes for details on it. But we should probably move from talking about Arage with their silicon technology, which is phenomenal at a phenomenal price, to a brand that Dave likes. This is going to be a weird one. And this is Gerard Perigo. And their silicon technology that comes in at around about 90 grand. Yes, I am a bit of a Gerard Perigo fanboy. Got to admit it. I'm not going to lie. Maybe Ricky doesn't... I don't think Ricky dislikes the brand. I just think he maybe has a bit of a challenge with some of the pricing but hey listen if it's a Bamford white ceramic if it's an Aston Martin green I'm all over it if it's one of these new this isn't even that new from what I can tell this is based on something that came out maybe nearly 10 years ago but anyway you can carry on because again you have years more experience when it comes to this kind of stuff than I do sure so this is their neo constant escapement the holy grail to many has been how do you transfer that power in a constant linear manner to the watch and the time telling and how do you get around this issue whereby when the main string unwinds it becomes a wider deviation of accuracy the lower it gets on its power reserve there's been many attempts dual barrels lots of different ways of trying to overcome it efficiency of escapements etc but Gerard Perigo, I think maybe we're talking now here back around about 1998, even potentially. So we're, you know, we're now going back, you know, 20 plus years where they've been developing a escapement system that uh, allows for a kind of bow system. Now, if you were to take that traditional cardboard train ticket and put it between your fingers and flex them so that it bowed, and as you do this with your fingers, it snaps back and forward between one way and the other. This was a method that they believed they could have a very, very fine silicon spring, effectively. I believe it's significantly thinner than a human hair that allowed you to get this bow. So almost like a, a sin wave that would allow a more constant distribution of the force as the power is released into the watch so that you have this kind of, as the name suggests, constant delivery of power through the entire spring range of the watch. And certainly I think this is something they've messed about with. The guy who originally came up with the concept was working at Rolex when he did. He then left and was with Gerard Perigo, really began to develop it then. He then ended up at, I believe, up at Tech Philippe. Did a little bit there, but never came to much. Back to Gerard Perigo and began to develop it again more there, where it really did kind of first come to market. Then he left, I'm not sure where he is now, but he's at one of the other brands, and other people at Gerard Perigo have taken that baton and ran with it. Really innovative. A bit like, you know, the, the Gerard Perigos of this world and the Ulysses Nardan, both very tightly related companies, really to me are significantly innovative especially when it comes to these new technologies and silicon technologies you know with with these guys being i arguably the founding fathers founding parents of silicon technology and watches many think it's you know rolex and omega and these guys no no it was ulysses nardan as part of that whole kind of group that came up with it and you know uh, they've taken the baton and they've really run with it again for me and I think for Ricky as well, some of the stuff, especially at Ulysses and Dan Silicon stuff, absolutely outstanding. Some of the stuff we saw at Geneva Watch Days is mind-blowing. Just love it to bits. So this watch, it's not cheap. I think it's in and about 105,000 uh, Swiss, no, 105,000 euros, around about 95,000 Swiss francs. So definitely in the more premium price bracket, it has to be said. 
very on the edge though. And unlike some other brands, have managed to bring this cutting-edge silicon technology to market. And it appears to be stable. That's all I'll say. So it's strange that this has come up just now because it was only a couple of weeks ago that I was going on a deep dive through the past. And again, I was on Hodinkee's website. Always seemed to end up there for some reason. It's good. And they had this thing from about 2012, 2013, talking about the prior iteration of this escapement technology. I might have been doing my research before I came across to Raj because I knew we were going to be talking about silicon and I was looking to just get a basis for it all. But it is good that brands are pushing forward with different things. And we've said it before, some people got a bee in their bonnet because, oh, it's not the way they did it in the olden days. But back in the olden days, when Louis Breguet was kicking about, he was using the cutting edge technology of that day to build watches. And that's what people are doing today with current technology. So I'm all for it. Price point, yeah, a little bit steep, more expensive than the Arage, more expensive than the Armstrong. But it's nice to see them doing that. And like you say, this seems to work whereas other people have almost got to market and then had to pull back because there have been problems. And one of the issues with silicon is it's fantastic until it's not. It's a little bit like a ceramic watch. It's brilliant, it's hard-wearing, it's tough, it's anti-scratch, but it will crack if you give it a serious donk. And that seems to be the bugbear with silicon escapements and movements. Yeah, no, very much so. Um, you know, uh, everything has its pros, everything has its cons. So, you know, I think the beauty with silicon used correctly is it gains or brings far more to the party than it than its negatives especially compared to the more traditional materials so you know if you want tradition there are plenty of watch brands out there that still play at proper old school so if that's your thing you've definitely got options if you want them and one of the options is Erebus watches that's how you pronounce it in the last edition of the show, we didn't have the facts to hand, but in the video, we edited in the facts because they were released from Jody. But his new watch, his new release, the Origin in a plethora of different colorways, oh yeah, just every color you could possibly imagine is available. It is done exceptionally well. He has got tons of orders. He's going to be a busy little boy. My only negative to the whole starting a watch brand thing for him is I hope he can still do three watch videos a week because I know how tough it is editing two podcasts and one video a week. So to add in run, running a brand new watch brand, that is going to be a tough cookie to crack. But he's currently in Dubai. He is currently working his way back to Scotland, and we will be catching up with him sooner rather than later. So expect some unique content when the Jody Meister appears back in Scotland and me and Dave are around. That'll be a good one. But we should finish off with a question from one of the members of the audience. Dave, do you want to read this one out? And we will try our best to furnish him with some answers. So we're going to say Mr. G. Evans because we're not entirely sure and my Welsh is awful. I mean, my English is bad enough and my Scots is even worse. But maybe Gideon, maybe Guidon, not quite sure. Anyway, please correct us because we've just massacred your name. Hey guys. I'm a fan of the show and listen to your beautiful voices while at the gym. You'll not be seen beautiful now we've massacred your name. I'm a young photographer that is looking to level up my skills and eventually start making a living out of my passion photographing watches. I'd like to ask you for advice on how to approach watch brands and sell myself to them. I would love to have a remote position at a company as a marketing photographer or along the lines of. Some of my work is available to view on my website. Check the show notes out if you want to look at his website or on his Instagram at macro.movement. Thanks for all the wonderful content you put out and keep it up. Thank you. That's a tough one because it is very difficult in this day and age to get yourself noticed and also to get yourself paid because there are so many people and the barrier to entry with photography is so low. Now you can get away with murder with decent lighting and a phone. Or you can buy an inexpensive SLR, DSLR, mirrorless camera and create fantastic results. Or you can recover and fix it in post. So it is a real tricky one to do. I would say if you're good at what you do, then get together a collection of good images with different styles. So it could be lifestyle shots. That's where a watch has been worn, perhaps in a driving position in a car, if it's a racing chronograph. Or if it's a seafaring watch, perhaps on a boat at the seaside, something like that, you know, try and play into the themes and some studio shots with some nice backgrounds. Have a look at the greats, have a look at the pictures you see from the big brands like Vacheron, IWC, uh, Blompong, Rolex, Tudor, see what they've got. 
try and see what currently works because that's what the other brands will be looking to do. And then if you happen to have a couple of watches or you can borrow some watches from friends, families, etc., take some different styles of pictures, create a catalogue, create a portfolio and get in touch with brands. They might not want to pay because they may have somebody already that helps them with stuff or they may be a brand that unfortunately uses renders because that is more common than not these days. It's cheaper just to take the SolidWorks files and the CAD drawings, render them out and have them in perfect colours and then send them out to magazines rather than doing it yourself. But the best thing to do is just jump on Instagram, look at what currently is getting done, look at other photographers, try and emulate what works, see what doesn't work, uh, and just go for broke. Try, it's nothing that's holding you back. Email is free, get in touch with people, see what they say. You may have to offer your services for free to begin with. That is the way things have gone with photography, videography, graphic design, web design for 20, 30, 40 years. It's just the way the game works, so you may have to do that. But if you are good, Cream always does rise to the top and potentially, like some of our friends, Ty Alexander, uh, you've also got Atom Moore. They have been at the top of their game for a number of years. They get the gigs, they get the work, but it's because they constantly keep in touch with the brands, with the magazines, with the websites and the blogs. We even had an email from a couple of people in the last few weeks saying, listen, if you need any photography, get in touch. So that's the way you need to do it. You need to be great at your job and great at marketing your job. All of what you say there is absolutely valid. It's a tough gig. There's lots of people and technology has got so good now that you can hide, unfortunately, a multitude of sins of talent behind good equipment. But if you've got that talent and if you've got that little edge, it will, as Ricky says, you will rise to the top through the kind of milk and you'll be that cream on the top there. A couple of points I thought while Dave was chatting there. There was a couple of people on Instagram GZM, I believe his name is, a photographer from Edinburgh, and he caught the attention of Adrian from Bark and Jack and ended up doing some promo stuff when he had his coffee business growing and his mugs. And another person that we mentioned on the show years ago is Hoppia, and I can't remember where he's from. It might be Finland, Sweden, Norway, one of those great countries. And he was doing some amazing photography, setting watches up and then setting up different things, almost like a parallax effect. And he caught the attention of everybody. He now does all the work, I believe, for Isotope, for Williamwood, and for Studio Underdogs. So if you've seen the cool pictures of the watermelon watch with pieces of watermelon, that wasn't just random shit photoshopped in. That was actually created, and it was bits of watermelon on sticks. And he photoshopped out the sticks so the actual watermelon had the exact correct lighting for it. So if you have a look at those guys, see what they're doing, try and emulate what they've done. And just think outside the box, take the cues and the hints and the tips from what's currently working and then add a little bit to it to make yourself stand out. I think that's it. Obviously, lots of great content to come and we're on that run up to Christmas. It's a while away, but not that far away. And we've got plenty of things. And with Dubai on the horizon, just you wait to see how many episodes we can shove in your Christmas stocking. Exactly right, Dave. So there we go. That is the end of our show. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. And we'll catch you guys again soon. 